evening, good evening, good evening, all. Sending out that notification. My apologies. <laughs> I really hate to be late, even in this setting. So my, my definite apologies for that. But this is relatively informal, so. Uh, I do ask you to forgive my tardiness. Of course, I'm not <laughs> running late to the facility since it's my house. <laughs> uh, lighting is not as good as in my other room, but we'll tough through it. I'll give it a minute or so to send out that notification that we're here. Like I said, we'll kick off in but a moment. Uh, and, and let me not just kill time here, especially for those who are watching back. Uh, 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 tough subject. Tough subject. Welcome to Gabe's page. Uh, um, what I'm dubbing let's chat to the to our broadcast let's chat uh, tough subject please feel, even if you're watching this back feel free to comment and, and as I get notification and I'm in a position to do so I'll come in in dialogue with you if you'd like to talk now this might be a subject you want to talk a bit more uh, privately uh, so feel free to message me on messenger if, if you have my number um, I recommend send me a text that way you can Kind of see my availability. I'm not always in a position just immediately to pick up the phone. So obviously, like anyone else, I, I am busy. But uh, uh, this is one of those subjects that's a bit on the difficult side. So you know, if you if you have some things you'd like to share, uh, uh, I understand. And by all means, let's 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 chat. Let's chat again. My lighting is not so super fly. I have to get a lamp. Uh, for my desk, but I'm going to go ahead and get into it. That's what I do. Uh, uh, I don't like to dilly-dally too long. Uh, so let's let's chat. Let's get into this. Uh, uh, grieving, and, and I told myself to pull this up, so I'm, I'm looking kind of past the camera. My apologies. Uh, I had a little bit of technical issues here, and laptop wanted to do some other stuff I didn't want it to do. <laughs> Which is not uncommon. All right. So, grief, uh, uh, by definition, and I typically want to go over to uh, uh, Miriam and Webster's on most of this stuff. Grief, according to Miriam and Webster's dictionary, of course, there's a few definitions there. A deep and uh, poignant distress caused by or as if by bereavement. As if by bereavement, a cause of of such suffering. Uh, let's see here. Uh, annoying or painful criticism. Okay, so so unfortunate outcome, disaster, and I, and I'm doing this because I want to make sure we understand right off the bat that grief is not necessarily something just in terms of bereavement the term they used or someone passing or 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 loss uh, 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 grief can occur that that dis, that distress uh, deep and poignant uh, distress can can be caused by really any kind of, of, of circumstance loss is usually what we connected to and of course loss of Loved ones uh, uh, is where we, we, we tend to take the word grief and mentally connect it to, excuse me, the loss of loved ones. Sorry, had a, a nice dinner. Thanks to my dear brother and friend, uh, Pastor Darrell Miller. Uh, uh, shout out to him. So so we're going to deal with it that way because that's for most of us. Uh, uh, I, I want to uh, uh, thank one of the viewers and I've been kind of saying this for a little while off and on. I don't, I don't say it religiously. If you come across a subject, you, you see the kind of stuff we're talking about. 
because most people know that I what I do for my everyday job. <laughs> it's really not a day job, my day and night job, truth be told. Uh, uh, so most will kind of recommend Christian or biblical topics, which is great. I don't have a problem with that, but that's not what Thursdays are about. Uh, uh, Thursdays are really about a bit more than that. Let's see if I can get a bit more lighting here. And I don't know if that's helping out, but uh, we'll, we'll tough through it. So Thursdays are not so much about Bible, though I will occasionally mention it as a, as a source of information. That's not what Thursdays are about. Thursdays are about general topics that affect our lives, Christian or non-Christian, with nearly 800 people, 800 accounts is how I say it, I'm connected to. Uh, certainly not everyone is a believer in Jesus Christ, so uh, or what we refer to as Christian or, or believer. So I, I want to deal with these topics and really just as a matter of uh, a real life and just a matter of life, I should say, in its general way. And we'll mention some things uh, uh, that may pertain to those who are in the faith uh, of Jesus Christ. We may mention some things when it's it's poignant. That said. Uh, this is a difficult subject, and, and, and there's no doubt about it. There's no two ways around about it. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, this was recommended. I want to give a proper shout out to uh, Trinka Mitchell, and I'm doing that to to because that's she was the one who suggested the subject. And also, uh, I want to encourage others if you have a subject that you know it could be one word, and and. and I'll develop it as I see it's a topic that I believe will reach as many as possible. Uh, or you can have a phrase. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to think it all the way through, all the points to be made. That's for me. I just need to know you have some interest in it. And so for uh, Ms. Trinka Mitchell, we want to thank you uh, for showing interest in the broadcast and, and uh, suggesting a pretty powerful and necessary topic. All right, that's it. A uh, little housekeeping uh, things, as they like to say in the business, a little housekeeping. Let's get let's get into this. Um, so the first thing I need to say is uh, this is about making us think. So you're not going to agree on much of what I say on any of these broadcasts because of your personal experience. So so I, I can't speak to your personal experience. In this case, you're you're grieving. I can't. I, you have to talk to me directly, and then I can speak directly to you. So this is going to be one you're going to be touchy. You, you've lost a loved one in the last year, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, but it was somebody very close to you. I'm, I'm just going to say it right now. I've been in the business of ministering to people, counseling with people for over 20 years. So I, I'm just going to tell you right now, I, I'm, I'm not going to know your circumstance. And even for those who I have talked to, this is not just about you. So I'm going to be as general as I possibly can. But but this is one of those subjects where, if I'm honest, it's, I'm going to say something, I'm going to suggest something, I'm going to make an illustration that might be a little close to home. I'm not trying to do that. Uh, if I pick a son passing away and you so happen to have had your son or you know somebody whose son passed away and their experience was not what I'm saying, don't judge me so rigidly. Now, you may jump in on this broadcast 20 minutes from now and not realize I'm saying this, but, you know, I may have to mention it from time to time. Uh, uh, this is why examples can get very precarious for people who do what I'm doing, because we try to be just general and yet say something that really hits home, but that, that there's a thin line uh, uh, that you have to draw, and no one can draw it for me. I have to draw it for myself. So I want to just, just say, I'm not apologizing, but I want to be clear up front that if I use an example that really touches home, I, I, this is not because I read something on your page and I'm trying to say something specific about you. If you haven't caught any of these broadcasts, I'm pretty blunt. So it's, <laughs> if I want to say something about somebody, I just say it. So uh, 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 I've been doing, I've been talking in front of people for a minute, so I'm not really scared uh, 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 to say what I'm thinking to say. I'm also conscientious, so I don't just, just, just just blurting stuff out. Anyway, so that being said, this is a Friday night, so I, 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 I'm not anticipating as many uh, uh, people to join me live. But for those who are here, I appreciate you. 
uh, say hello and, and, and let's chat. Let's chat. Uh, I do want to say this. I better say this because I, I have gotten it a, a few times now. Gabe, is it okay to comment? Absolutely. Uh, throw a question in there. Throw a comment. Obviously, be respectful. You know, there's no need for profane language and, and all of that kind of thing. Uh, uh, you can you can select any emoji faces you choose. That's your business. But uh, um, if you're questioning something I'm saying, that's fine. You know, be respectful. Uh, we're, we're, we, we, we can handle it. We're not going to fall apart. So uh, now let's get into it. Uh, so grieving. Typically, we connect it to loss and in particular, the loss of loved ones. Uh, before I deal with that kind of thing, I, I want to start immediately out the box and go a different way with this than you're anticipating. I want to go a different way than you're anticipating, because the moment we start talking about grieving and loss, we all kind of, and I do it too, we immediately kind of go towards the, the presumption of the whole process of somebody dying and that kind of thing. I don't even want to get into the four, so I'm suggesting five stages of grieving, because if I do that, that's going to take us down that funnel, down that tunnel. I want to go differently. And if I do that, I hope that it'll it'll allow you to really kind of focus in and yet not be so quick to just, you know, walk down those typical corridors that we do mentally. And I understand that. Trust me, I do. So so here's what I want us to think about really from the from the gate. And that is uh, uh, I don't think a lot of times we really pay attention to who we are psychologically. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to get too deep with this, but just stay with me for a second. Who we are mentally, maybe that's a better word. I don't, I don't know if we really stop and, and pay attention to who, how we're built, how we were raised. And then when somebody passes, uh, uh, um, and especially if we're trying to be strong because we got to get through the funeral or homegoing service again. I know some are homegoing. Well, funeral, let me just say funeral because that's everybody. You can specialize it as a homegoing service, but it's a funeral. And so the reality of it is a lot of times we don't account for who we are mentally and therefore we don't account for who we are emotionally. What do I mean account? What I mean by account is we really don't know as it were ourselves we, we, we're not really keen on what our emotional makeup is. So, for example, my pastor, from what I can see stand on the outside, of course, he can speak for himself, is a very jovial person. He, he seems to be, and I've seen him in some difficult situations there at the, at the facility, uh, uh, at the worship center. And, and for the most part, I've watched him process through something that kind of comes at him that's difficult, unexpected, even and he will work through to that smile on his face and that energy that he's that we know him for. Like you, I've watched him do this. I've even caused it. <laughs> anyway, and I and I've watched him, but not only just in business meetings and things of that nature, but even behind somebody passing, that you could clearly tell he was affected by him. He was affected by that passing, right? Uh, um, and. What I thought was fascinating is watching him process to get to that point in, in his grieving to be himself. You missed it. Let me, let me pull it back. Let me give it to you again. If we're going to process through grieving, let me go another way, successfully, which means live. Because if, if you really want to know what the goal is uh, 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 of grieving well, if I can say that, it is to live, not so much to resume your life per se, even though you may have to go back to work and those things, but it is to live a life. And if you are not grieving well, it, it's pretty easily seen you are not living. You're not living. You, 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 and we'll get into some examples of what I think it proves that. But essentially, if you don't grieve well, you're, you, you don't really live. You end up, in some sense, stopping your life at the point where the person ceased to be or maybe at the point of the funeral or, and, and burial. Okay, So, so the, the whole idea of the grieving process and the four stages and the five stages and, and all of the counsel and, and when hospice comes in is to try to help the person or people to deal with what is happening 
and yet not deal with it so to the point they cease to live. Let me, let me, let me, it's going to take a little bit, so I'm going to let you chew on some of this slowly. So the object gave is to, to, to face the death and come out on the other end living. Yes. Even though you are not physically dead as you walk through the burial process, as you walk through getting the funeral arrangements together, you are very much alive. But I've had obviously enough conversations over the years with people who talk about numbness, which so happens to be that first stage. Denial, numbness, you know, a, 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 a sense of uh, disbelief, right? So, so, so I'm going to slip it in a little bit there. So, so when somebody passes, you, you actually, and this is, this could be brief for some, long for others. But what happens is because you're going through a, pro a process, psychologically or mentally, there is a numbness. Now, this is a trip. Stay with me. Ready? This is, this is different. You probably haven't heard this before. Stay with me. What I've come to realize in doing this, and obviously I have loved ones who've passed, is I realize that a lot of times we are not mentally and emotionally prepared. Very two, two very different things, two different things. We are not mentally and emotionally prepared. I don't mean in the moment. I don't mean in the moment. I mean just period. We don't deal with life with a full recognition that people, including us, are going to die. It just got tough. But stay with me. I know this is a tough subject. And the only way I know to deal with it is just be clear and upfront and concise. That most of us and people of faith are probably most guilty. I'm just going to be honest. We know death happens. As a matter of fact, that good book, as we they used to call it, says a time to be born and a time to die. It says that. And in that same good book, and even in any good history book, we know, you stay with me now, that children die. Children dying is not new. Children dying is not new. Stillborns, uh, 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 you know, on and on and on, away, all the way through. Children dying and not outliving their parents is not new. I don't live that far from a hospital by the name of St. Jude's Children Hospital. And many of them, statistically speaking, are not coming up out of there. They suffer from leukemia, which is a form of cancer, and they are not coming out of St. Jude's, say they just get allowed to be taken home so that they can pass at home. So the reality of it is that I, I went for the I went for the most most painful for what I've been told, which is a child dying. My first funeral as a young minister in my early twenties was a four year old child, who I do believe is the same age as my niece. So he'd be thirty years old now. That was many years ago. Many a twenty something year old young minister, uh, uh, and I had to expedite the whole thing because they didn't know anyone else to do it. So I expedited the funeral and. Then I had to do the eulogy. Uh, thankfully, I didn't have to go to the burial. I was very young, standing next to that casket for about an hour and a half. It was rough. I'm not going to lie. And the casket, you know, yay big and not probably any bigger than my desk. It was rough, especially for a young minister, his first funeral. And I got to expedite this place packed full of people. And the child died. Uh, uh, I remember freshly, the child died because grandma didn't put the child in a seatbelt had herself and everyone else was seat belted, but the car was so full, couldn't put the child in a car seat. And so got into an accident, child goes through the windshield, child does not make it. First funeral, 20 something years old, and I got a place full of people and I've got to work through this and help them with their grieving. It's, it's, in, it's, it's etch a sketched in my brain, as you can imagine. My point is because we don't really live our lives because we think that's morbid. I'm throwing out words that I hope you're catching. Because we think death is no morbid. Even though we know, if you're 25 years old and older, you know death is, and probably even younger depends on the circumstance, you know death is a part of life. You absolutely know it. There is no doubt in your mind. Death is a part of life. 
And I, I don't mean just people getting older, 90, 100, 125, and then they just quietly go to sleep. No, we know the tragic deaths occur. And since this is 2020 or uh, 2020, I think this subject, as I told, uh, uh, told the young lady, makes sense. I'm surprised I hadn't done it before. We don't prepare ourselves mentally. So then when the emotional event happens, especially if it's suddenly, we are truly unprepared. So then, you, you, Gabe, you got to, okay, how do you prepare yourself? Well, the first thing we have to do mentally to be able to handle ourselves emotionally and therefore get to a place of living. I hope I didn't go too fast. So what we have to do to be prepared, even for those deaths that truly catch us off, nobody saw it coming, person had a heart attack. I've had a couple of people I went to high school with, which means they're not that old, who have passed this year. And, and, and the news took my breath away. I'm not going to lie. Took my breath away. You know, my brother's age, this kind of thing. Uh, a healthy young man just just passed what a week ago uh four kids you know on and on and on and on so 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 these events happen no we're not exempt he's somebody's son he's somebody's husband he was somebody's father okay uh, maybe somebody's sibling I, I, he was older than me so i don't know the reality of it is 48 going on 49 if i'm not mistaken he's gone now and uh, I, don't, I think it was sudden. So, so if that's the case, that's powerful. That's he's he's gone. His four kids, I do believe, are, are, are of age, but but still they're gone. Still their dad is gone. Uh, if, if, for example, let me let me say how, how would you know? So if your if your child goes into the military, right, and and there's war going on, th there needs to be a conversation. There needs to be a discussion. If, if, if one of your children or your siblings or somebody wants to go and become a police officer and even in a quiet area, there's still the possibility of some type of situation where they could unfortunately suffer a, a tragic end. We live our lives. We now, now what I've learned, let me let me share this, and I'm sure some of you will find this to be true. I love elderly people. I, and I, when I say elderly, I mean, you know, 75, 80, you know, on and up. Uh, 80, 85. I know people who, my grandmother died at 90 years old. And one of the reasons why I love them is because they're so candid, it'll take your breath away. <laughs> Sometimes they'll say something just out of the blue. You'd be like, huh? <laughs> it take you a minute to process. Like, did she say, say that? Grandma, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> but but they'll say things like, yeah, I'm going to meet Jesus, and you don't want to hear that. But why? I'm going to share my personal experience. You know me. So, 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 uh, hey, welcome. My father had cancer. He's very much alive. Obviously, you've seen recent photo. He had cancer. Uh, uh, I think my son was not born yet. And uh, it was an emergency surgery. He would have died if my mother hadn't gotten him to the hospital. They literally took him in. He was in surgery. And if I'm not mistaken, coming out of surgery before my mother could grab a hold of herself and contact her children. That's how emergency it was. He would have died of, uh, died of a cancer ball sitting between his stomach and his intestine. Okay. So I could have very well, I could very well be sitting here. My father's passed away before my son, before he even met my son. My son is 11. That's how quickly life can happen. So I'm sitting in ICU. Was he? On, I think he was out of ICU now. And he's in his own room. And he's just staring up at the screen. TV's on, but he's not watching it. And I'm sitting next to his bed. And not, we're not really saying anything. This is just a crazy moment. My father's always been strong. And, and boom, he's laying in a hospital bed. Just, you know, numb. I told you, grief can come from any circumstance. He was alive, but I was still going through that first stage of numbness. And out of his mouth comes these words. Never forget it. One of those things, it's just sketched in my brain. I'm ready to die. I'm sitting at his bedside. He almost died. They saved his life. He's still alive today. His words were, and I quote again, I am ready to die. Did he, was he depressed, Gabe? Nope. Nope. That's been years and years and years ago. Again, my son's 11. Nope. 
not depressed. Show no signs of depression whatsoever. And obviously I would know what that is because of what I do in my educations in psychology. So I'm, I'm keenly aware of it. None. He was a man resolved that his life passing before his eyes, whatever, he never said those phrases, but I suspect he, he may have had that ex experience. His brother having already died, his sister having already died, his father having already died, within about a six months to a year clip of each other. So this is a man who had faced death. He'd been in ministry at that point 40-something years, uh, you know, 40 years. So he had resolved. He had done exactly what I'm talking about. He prepared himself, himself, for his own passing. For his own passing. Uh, 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 a, a lot of times, people, we, we look at death with such a, 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 a angry view. Uh, 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 we, we look at death as, as oh, hey, I, I definitely understand that, uh, as you can hear my own experience, uh, 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 Ms. Cortez. We, we look at death with, such, with such, a, such a shame on you. How dare you? Don't take my son, my daughter, my mother, my father, my, my sister, my brother. Don't take my best friend. Again, death, I know this is not what you thought you were going to hear, but trust me, it's necessary. Death is a part of life. Yes, Gabe, we all know that. We all say it when somebody dies. We say it when the person dies. We say it when they finally say, hey, pull the plug here. And after we've prayed all of our prayers, God, please no, God, please no, God, please no. I'll get there in a minute. No, 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 no. Yes, death. Now we got to spend the rest of our lives, however long we live, trying to process that we had to say yes to the inevitable for all of us. We're not doing what we're supposed to do here. So before I get into grief itself, I want to make sure we really think about this. Look at the people in your community. You didn't think I could do it, did you? Look at the people in your community. Are you really ready if your mother and your father are still alive and you're 50? Do the math. Do the math. Do the math. If you're 60 and your mother and father are still alive, do the math. Come on. Do the math. Do the math. You don't need me to do it for you. You do the math. You know how old they are. You, you know their bodies are slowed. You see them. There's a gentleman goes to the church. He's 93. I mean, if somebody comes and says, uh, 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 Brother Bill is gone, nobody's, I mean, we're going to be sad, but nobody is going to be shocked. But why is it that? Because now he's not my family, right? But if he's my family and I'm not readying myself, guess what I'm going to do? Not Billy. Not Billy. Why? Yeah, but Gabe, my son was only 10. But Gabe, my, 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 my daughter was only 22. She had her life ahead of us. Why do we say stuff like that? Let me turn the corner. Let me now, let me just help ready our minds. Why do we say stuff like that? Honestly, does anyone on here watching this live or watching this back know the future? Go ahead. Take your time. Think about it before you answer. Do you know the future? I don't. I don't. Do you? Does any of us? You can call all the divinators, psychics you want. Does anyone know the future? And if you believe in God, okay, God, but you're not God. So none of us actually know the future. We don't know if our children are going to live to be old. We don't actually know if they're going to bury us. We don't actually know if anyone's going to get cancer. We don't actually know when we climb into our cars if we're going to make it to our destinations. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. And yet sometimes we can be so arrogant to believe that when, when our children and grandchildren are born, my son is 11, so I'm talking to me too, I just assume that he's going to make it to adulthood. I just assume he's going to bury me. I just assume. On what, on what basis do I have the right to assume that? Because I really, really want him to. Because I don't want to face any grief. And yet I have plenty of people I've gone to school with who have buried their children. How arrogant is it of me to think that I should be exempted and they're not exempted? They're not exempted. 
They're not. My goddaughter, at if I remember correctly, two years old, I think she just graduated from high school, had a heart rate of 250 beats a minute. And I had the unfortunate responsibility to sit there at Ronald McDonald House in Fresno, California, and watch her hooked up to tubes. And the doctors couldn't explain what was going on. 250 beats a minute. Oh, she's healthy now. She's alive now. But her parents, nor I, nor my sister as her godmother, none of us had any real clue if she was going to walk up out of that place. That's the truth. See, how do you prepare your, yourself, Gabe? You have to tell yourself this life is not promised to anyone. There it is. There it is. The only way we can truly prepare ourselves for the inevitable of this life, which is death, I don't care if you don't believe in God or not, death is still the truth for all of us, is to, to, to deal with the mental reality while we live, to, to, to not walk around morbid. See, see that word morbid will come up. Well, Gabe, I don't want to be walking around, you know, just thinking about death all the time. That's morbid. No, I'm talking about thinking about the brevity of life. I'm not talking about thinking about death. Death is the result. I'm talking about thinking about life. I'm talking about thinking about a life that you live with intention and that you encourage your children to live with intention because the reality of it is, uh, let's see, how many schools just a few years ago? Gunmen were walking onto elementary school campuses and children and, and teachers and faculties did not make it. Come on, come on. Just, 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 just this year, uh, uh, people were being uh, shot with rubber bullets at, at protests, peaceful protests. There was a 19-year-old kid walking around with an, uh, with an assault rifle shooting people. Come on. When I got back to Louisiana two years ago, there, there were murders taking place not far from where I'm sitting. And one of them was a father and a son. He was walking down the street with groceries and somebody drove by and killed him. Him and his son. See, see, so there, there's a part of us as my father sitting there, laying there on his bed. You, you have to live your life with the recognition. There is no guarantee you're going to see your children come of age. There's no guarantee you're going to see your grandkids come of age. There's no guarantee you're going to see your great-grandkids come of age. Now, my grandmother lived to be 90. She saw several generations after her come of age. My mom's siblings are all still alive. But on my dad's side, it's not the case. So there has to be a living with a sense of purpose and an awareness that this life caps at the point of death. Okay, so we got that. How does that affect us when it comes to grieving? Ah, great question. Because ultimately what grieving can really be said to be is, a, is emotional stages where your mind is, is processing. That's what your mind is built to do. Let me say it again. Our minds are built to process. That's what our minds are built to do. But what happens when someone we love dearly, I don't, I don't want to name any positions of people, friends, whatever, you just come up with that person in your head. And when that person died or, or whatever the case may be, what did your emotions do to your thinking? Take a minute. You know what happened. I wasn't there. You know what happened. Your emotions shut down your mind. Your emotions attacked your thinking. Your emotions said, that's callous to be thinking about what suit am I going to put on my dad? That's wrong to think that. No, it's right to think that. See, I freed somebody right there. You missed it. Let me try it again. Let me go it this way, this way. F funeral preparations, to me, are a major part of the grieving process. But let me give you one that is huge. Ready? You ready for it? Viewing the body. You didn't see that coming, did you? Viewing the body is a huge thing. Have you ever asked yourself, asked, question, not felt, asked, process, come on, process with me. 
It's a tough subject. Let's process together. Have you ever wondered to yourself why the viewing of the body? Why? Why have you come and looked down in a casket where, you, where that loved one never lived, never slept in a casket, never had anything to do with a casket unless they were themselves at some point standing there viewing someone else? But haven't you ever wondered why a viewing before the day of the funeral, why come and see the body? Why open it up? Why paint the face, putting on makeup? Why put a suit or a dress? Why go through all of that? Why come here and stare at a shell? Hmm. Wow. It's a powerful question. Now, I don't know the reason why, from a standpoint of why they do that, I would be curious to ask somebody who's in that business. But here's what I think. I think that the reason why you do that is because you have to start processing. And that process we call grieving. And that process is not just a ball of emotion, but it is your mind processing. That person is not here. I need to see their shell. I need to know they're not here. When I get the news that I'm at home or I'm across the country that so-and-so is gone, my mind won't let me deal with it. And I, and I, and I don't want to see it. I, I really don't want to know when the doctor calls and are you so-and-so? Yes, I am. Your so-and-so, your that mom, whatever is gone. No, the doc, please, no, no, you cry. You cry, but you're not actually actually processing. Watch this. Those initial tears is not actually because you've resolved that the person is gone. Those initial tears can actually be viewed as disconnected. Some people don't even cry. They, they, they just immediately attack their thoughts, which is trying to connect to the fact that the person is gone. And so they go to work and they smile. And they got to run to the bathroom. You got to go to the car every break and lunch. Nope, 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 nope. Can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. It may take them three days, four days. They got to get plane tickets or they got to, you know, get themselves together. They got to go after work and then they go in. And what do they have to do? See the body. Why? Why do we need to see the body? And I hate that part. And I'm in, I'm in ministry. I, I hate it. <laughs> but, but the reality of it is, there's a psychological need. Listen to me now. Ready? To connect. Connect, Gabe? Yes. Connect what? Good question. To connect my thoughts with the truth. What truth, Gabe? That the person is truly gone. Yep. That there is a point where there has to be a connection between my thoughts and the person's being gone. So seeing the body, I've actually talked to people whose loved ones were kidnapped and unfortunately, or the body was missing and things like that. And the one thing they talk about is never really being able to grieve because there was no body. Have you ever heard that? I used to watch a show, reality TV, it's called reality TV show called Missing Persons, Closed Case and all those things. And they say after so many, I think after six months, I think really, but two years or something like that, then they, they, they're even willing to take you through essentially a funeral. Because what happens is, listen to me now, what happens is, is the person is stuck. They're stuck. Well, I just believe my daughter, my son, whoever is still alive. I just believe they're still alive. I just believe they're still alive. So what did I say 30 minutes ago? You get stuck. Your mind is trying to process loss. Now, that's a whole nether broadcast by itself about a missing person situation. But I'm doing that to contrast when you have the body, when the body is there to be viewed. And in particular, at the wake, in, in particular, at the point of going to view before that final closing of the coffin. 
There is a psychological need. Hear me now. I distinguish the psychological from the emotional. There is a psychological need. Listen to me now. To connect your thinking to the reality or the truth that that person is not there. There is a need to do that. Listen to me. I don't do this on Thursdays. At least I try not to. But let me minister a second. Even if you're not a believer, stay with me. You need to allow yourself. Let me stop right here and, and, and do this. You need to give yourself permission. And if the person is long since buried, okay, they was buried five years ago, two years ago, 10 years ago, seven days ago, and you haven't done this. If somebody has, here's another thing we do, an obituary. Yes. If somebody has an obituary, you realize while you're listening to me talk, you didn't do this. You, if you're honest with yourself, you didn't give yourself permission. You had emotions and your emotions attacked your thinking because your thinking was trying to process. That's what your brain and your mind inside your brain is intended to do. It was doing its job. It was telling you they're gone. They're not going to come back. You're not going to see them again. And your emotions said, no, not my whoever, not my, your emotions told you to tell you no, your emotions told you to lie. I'm just going to have to say it straight. I'm sorry. I got to say it straight. Your emotions are lying to you. They are gone. They are not listening to your prayers. They are not there at the gravesite. I'm going to just be plain for a few seconds. Don't, don't get offended. Stay with me. I know you're going to the tombstone. But I want you to catch this. And you've heard this before. Would your loved one want to truly be, if they could, God allow them to come visit you, do you think they would want to find you at their grave site? Do you think your mom, your dad, your, your child, your whoever, your best friend who passed away, do you think the one place they would want to find you is pining over them at their grave site where they are no longer there? I'm going to just give it to you in a formal question. Take a minute. Don't get mad at me. Think. I know you have a connection to the tombstone. I know you've decided to, to go and speak to what you think is them at the tombstone. But the fact is, the reason why they open up that casket, as morbid as it may sound now that I'm talking about it, and they want you to see the body, is so that your brain will do its job and process for you that they are gone. But because we don't want to do it, we'll then spend 30 years of our life going to the gravesite, not just to put new flowers. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about just to make sure they're keeping up the site. No, I mean to sit there, pull up a chair and have a full conversation. What you don't realize you're doing to yourself psychologically is you're trying to keep them alive. But your mind is saying, no, they're gone. Your mind is saying, no, they're gone. And you are literally getting, I've seen people get upset with themselves because they don't want to let go of sweater. They, so, so if it's not the grave site, it's a sweater. It's, it's some china. I'm not talking about a family heirloom and you appreciate that and you, no, you literally almost worship it. Yeah, I'm going to go deep on you. You are literally worshiping the sweater. If somebody touches one, don't touch that sweater. That was grandma's sweater. Don't sit in that chair. That's grandpa's chair. Oh, 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 okay, sorry, Grandma. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, baby. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to yell at you. you. But you know, that's how Grandpa used to sit in that chair, you know. And you know, he didn't like nobody in his chair. And now your grandchild is sitting there, uh, Daddy, I think Mama's losing it. No, son, it's okay. It's okay. She's just, you know, that's where her, you know, she was married for 70 years, son. She was married for 70 years, but daddy, that's a chair. Your, your grandchild got more sense than you realize. Now, the, the grandchild ain't thinking about what I'm saying, but that grandchild knows, no, that's actually just a chair. That's a chair. But, but in our minds, we won't let it happen. We won't let it just be a chair. We won't let it just be the room that they slept in. Oh, Gabe, you messing now. Well, I might as well go and put all my whole, whole leg in there now. No, nope, that's grandma's room. We can't change nothing in there. That's grandma's room. Don't touch grandma's room. Okay, mom, uh, grandma been dead five years. What? What? 
Don't touch grandma's room. You got your son sleeping on the couch because you don't want him to go in grandma's room. You don't want him to go in your mom's room or your dad's room. It's time to move on in your life. You get a job. And I've actually ministered to people like this, so I won't say no names because they, may, they may actually be on my Facebook page. But I've actually ministered to people who had job opportunities, listen to me, and refused the job opportunity that they really wanted because that means they wouldn't have been able to visit the gravesite. And they literally said out of their mouth, I know that's probably not healthy. And I didn't say nothing else. Now, I didn't follow up to see if they really let it go, if they took the job, but they were struggling because they made the gravesite them. Listen to what I'm saying. This is you. You don't have people telling you this. Counselors are not going to tell you this. They got to follow. And as I told uh, some, uh, three or four people recently, they got to follow their training. I don't have to. Listen to me. Go visit. Make sure the site is clean. Do your thing. But don't sit there and have a conversation. They're not there. And if they were to ever pop up, obviously it would scare you. But if they showed up, they would tell you why. They would ask you, why are you here? You, you, you're hurting the memory of me because the longer, listen to me, psychologically speaking, the longer you do that, all your memories will be at their gravesite. You don't even realize it. No one will tell you, so I'll tell you. Be mad at me. I can handle it. Trust me. <laughs> I've been doing this 27 years, going on 28. You're going to turn all your memories of them to the gravesite. To the gravesite. Do you really want all your memories? I don't care if it's 10 memories, 150 memories. Do you really want all your memories of them to be the gravesite? Yeah, I'm going to go talk to mom today. You're going to go talk to mom? Yeah, I'm going to the gravesite. I've literally heard people say that. Yeah, I'm going to go out and talk to dad and I'm going to visit my brother while I'm there. I understand why you're saying it. Listen to me. I understand why people are saying it, but they don't, they don't understand that what has happened is when the time came to view that body, they disconnected themselves and they've been stuck ever since. They don't even realize. My father calls it a uh, 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 stuck in a permanent state of grief. And if you're talking to tombstones as if that's really your mom, your dad, your brother, your son, your daughter, if you're telling yourself they had their whole life ahead of them, they should have become, first of all, who are we to say, again, it's a bit arrogant on our part to assume that everybody should live to be 100. To assume everybody should live to be. So how old do you think the person should be? How old do I think my son should get? If I'm honest, I'm going to just tell you the truth for me. I want him to live long enough for me to die first. Now, I don't know what his destiny is, but I'm just going to tell you me. See, don't get mad because I'm telling you me. If I'm just honest, I want him to outlive me. I don't want to have to bury my own child. Now, I know people who have, and I don't know why I think I'm more special than them. And I'm not. But the reality of it is, that's the arrogance that I live by. I'm talking about me. My son shouldn't, I shouldn't have to bury my son. My son should bury me. Now, who, who am I speaking for? God? Then, then I get mad at God. Then I'm going to get mad at God. Now, that's a whole other subject. But, but I'm just throwing it out there for my Christian friends who are mad at God because they outlive their child. As if that's never happened in human history. Now, he hung his son on the cross, but you think your child should have lived to at least be 75 and you 95. Because trust me, it's flipped. How long do you think I want my parents to live? So that means we're going to all live forever. They don't want me to, to die before them, and I don't want them to die at all. Come on. You know how this works. You don't have to respond to me, but we all know how this works. You know what I'm saying to be true. The truth of the matter is, even though we know death is a part of life, it is as natural as life itself. Truth be told, and I'm just speaking this stuff out loud, but I know we think it. I don't want anybody to die at all, period, ever. That's Gabe talking. That's Gabe talking. I'm going to just be honest. I don't want anybody to die that I know, period. I don't. I know death is a part of life. I know that, but I don't want anybody to die, period. I don't care how old they are. I don't want them to die at all. At all. 
Now that's arrogance. I'm just be be transparent. That's arrogance to the nth degree. I know it's arrogance. It's foolhardy. So guess what happens when somebody dies? I'm not ready. I'm going to fight emotionally what my mind is naturally going to want to process. I'm going to want to say the person is dead. I'm going to look into the coffin and I'm going to see their lifeless body. I'm going to know they're not there, but my emotions, my arrogance said, nope, they there. Nope, they there. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're not there. And how dare me? I'm talking about, I'm going to use me. How dare I sit there when other people are trying to grieve responsibly and maturely, but I'm going to be at the funeral and we've all been there. We've all heard that one up there acting a plum fool because they didn't want to deal with the truth in the thinking so that they can control their emotions. Now we can get into they didn't treat the person right. That's a whole other thing. But the reality of it is this is about grieving. And what did I say in the beginning? I set the standard. Let me go back to it because it's been a minute. The standard for doing grief well. Gabe, okay, really? Did you say grief well? Yes, I did. If you want to grieve well, the object of grieving well is to come out of that grieving living. It is not to die emotionally and mentally with that person. But Gabe, if it's my son, if it's my daughter, I got an 11 year old. I know what you're saying. I know people who've buried their children. I know them well. I got a several on my page who might hear me talking about this. And I have great respect for what they've been through. And that doesn't make them greater than anybody else. I know people who who their mother passed, their sister passed, their, their husband passed. I know a lot of women who, who are grieving, a lot of men who are grieving, who are widows. And they're not old. And they weren't old when their husbands or wives died. But the reality of it is, and I'll try to keep it general, the reality of it is we have to live like we have an awareness of this fact. I played sports in high school. Let me go away from this for a moment. I played sports in high school. So I happened to play football. And, and our football coaches were very clear with us. Look, this is a dangerous sport. It's a violent sport. People get hurt. And I saw people get wheeled off in wheelchairs. I'm just telling you. I got hurt. I have a back injury that started with getting hit, uh, going across to get a pass. I have a back injury because of it. So the reality of it is, and then it got made worse through car accidents, rear end accidents and things. But anyway, I played the sport. I heard the coaches say to me, preparing me mentally for a potential moment, which did happen to me, to get injured. They were, listen to what I'm doing, they were telling us this is a dangerous sport and people do get injured. And even on rare occasions, people even die. Why did they do that? Didn't they want us to be tough? Didn't they want us to not be scared? Yes. But they didn't want us to be foolish enough to think that injuries won't happen. Why? Because then when we would see somebody get injured, and I saw people suffer some stuff, some injuries that I don't even want to describe to you, wheeled off, and you know we didn't know if they was going to walk and come back to school and all this kind of thing the next week and all that kind of stuff. Uh, um... We had to operate with maturity. And you, I'm, I'm looking at these young boys, big boys. And you can see tears well up and up in their face. And that's not just because that was their friend. It's because they had to walk back on that field once they wheeled that guy off to play again. The game wasn't over. You understand? They had to be able to do it again. They had to be able to go out there and actively engage in this dangerous sport that just saw their comrade get wheeled off the field. When you bury your loved one, no matter what the age, no matter what the tragic level, you have to be able to live. You have to. We all know this. You have to be able to. But Gabe, you have no right. Yes, I do. Because we all have lost loved ones. We've all buried somebody. And you don't know who I've buried. You don't know my past. So you can't tell me no more than I can tell you. But what I do know for a fact is you're still alive, aren't you? Yes. So you have to live. Let me finish up. I wanted to do that. I didn't want to go through the typical, typical thing to do. 
So let me finish up. First thing I recommend, grieve on purpose. Grieve in here on purpose. Let your emotions do what it does. Your emotions in the grieving process is just the natural response to how you're processing. Let me do it again. Your emotion is just the natural processing. You may not believe in God, but I do. And God built us in a way so that our emotions are natural unless we're trying to repress our thinking. I, I've actually seen dogs grieve. Now, I'm not a pet lover. I don't have pets. But I've actually seen dogs, and I've had you know, owners tell me about, you know, as a matter of fact, my pastor just lost two, have two dogs. One died while they were out of town, unfortunately. And when they got back in town, they saw their other dog in a place of grieving. God built us to grieve. God built us to grieve. He, he, he built us. Even creatures, gay? well, we're all creatures, but even animals? Yes. He built us. Why? You ready for this? You didn't see this coming because that's a part of our connection in our community. Again, you may not be a Christian, but just stay with me a second. In our Bible, if you're not a Christian, it says weep with them that weep. Not just be happy, be happy. No, it also says, weep with them that we, you mean to tell me God acknowledges the fact that we grieve? Yes. Yes. And we need to do it on purpose. Purpose? Yes. We need to grieve on purpose. Now, grieving just isn't crying. Grief is a time of laughter. Look at the four stages. Trust me on this. I don't want to go through them. My time is already up. But look at the four stages. Believe it or not, reflection, laughter, these are natural parts of your grieving. And do you know what most people do? I'm not supposed to be laughing right now. My mom just died. I'm not supposed to laugh right now. My dad just died. I'm not supposed to laugh right now. My friend died. Are you kidding me? You better laugh your butt off when you remember some goofy thing that y'all said to each other. You better laugh until you can't laugh anymore when you remember how they used to put their shirt on and it used to be always backwards. When they used to walk with a limp and it used to crack you up or they used to tell jokes or they used to act a fool, you better laugh because that's a part of the grieving. You better smile because that's a part of the grieving. Give yourself permission to think the thoughts, to remember when you saw them in the hospital. No, Gabe, I don't want to remember that. Yes, you do. Why? Because there's going to be times when you're going to almost think you can convince yourself that they're still alive. Our minds are powerful and also dangerous. And if we're not careful, we can snap our minds by trying to deny the truth. Excuse my intensity, but this is serious stuff. There are people who are dealing with depression because ultimately, I'm not, I'm not mad at them. I'm not blaming them. They have a real reason to be depressed. Hear me. But part of the depression is, is driven by trying to act like it's not the case, that it really hasn't happened. They're simply not gone. Yes, they are. Remember when you saw them with the tubes coming out. Remember when they opened up the casket. You didn't want to look, but something in your mind caused you to look because God is so good that he drives you to look so that you can resolve that the person is gone. Because if you don't resolve that the person is gone, you are going to find yourself five years later still stuck. Mom, is that you? Your mom ain't walking through the door, baby girl. Daddy, is that you? Your dad ain't finna come do nothing for you. I had a dream about dad. Okay, that's wonderful. Well, I thought he was gonna come help me in the situation. No. Take the advice that you, you got from him and go out and make it happen. In other words, let me speak like I'm your dad. Live. Because that's what he would tell you to do. Baby girl, don't cry for me. Live. He wants you to live. 
Even the child who you had to bury would hate to see you just sitting there opining over them. They would even feel bad. Can you imagine? Take a minute with me. Stay with me a couple of more minutes. I'm going to go over, but that's okay. I want you to think about it. That son, that daughter that died, they would show up and be like, Mom, I'm gone. I'm good. Get up and live. I'm good. Get up and live. What are you doing, mom? What are you doing, dad? What are you doing, bro? What are you doing, sis? Get up and live. Why are you sitting here? Because you gone. I'm gone. Hear your words? I'm gone. I'm gone. Let me speak for them. They're gone. They're telling you they're gone. And you know how they're telling you audibly? No. In your dreams? No. They're telling you because they're not walking through the door. They're telling you because, no, they're, 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 their bodies are decaying. They're no longer there. They're out of their bodies now. They're gone. Their essence is gone. And if you're a believer, you know that essence is with the Lord. So, so they're not there. And you can go to the gravesite every single birthday, every single death day, every single graduation for their brother or sister. You can go there for every wedding anniversary that you would have. It's now 50 years, but he died in your first five years. He's the only real love of my life. And then you say, I really want to get married again. And you can't figure out why psychologically, uh-oh, why you can't connect to another person. You find something wrong with every single woman or man across your face. You're not like my husband, my dead husband. Well, I can't be like them. Because I'm not them. Calling that person by the name of your husband or wife. Your, your, your deceased husband or wife. Calling your, your remaining children by the name of their dead brother or sister. Tell me this stuff don't happen. I know y'all don't want to hear it come out of me. I understand that, but this is what I do. My job is to get us thinking and to really consider the magnitude. To really think about grief and the necessity of grief. You never heard that before. I just tie grief and, 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 and necessity together. You've got to do it. I'm over time. Let me, let me finish up. So the first thing you've got to do, and really the main thing, is do it on purpose. Now you go get your four stages and five stages of grief. Let me give you another bit of, bit of advice here. Do not vilify counselors. Don't vilify counselors. Don't make them the bad guy. Because they have a responsibility at some point or another to say to you what you already know to be true. Do not vilify people who give counsel in the time of grieving. Don't go off on them. They're just doing their jobs. Don't get, oh, you're just doing this for money. Oh, you just, you just saying that because you don't even mean it. You didn't know my mother. You didn't know my father. You didn't know my son. No, they didn't. No, you're right. Let me tell you what they can't tell you. Let me tell you what they can't tell you. You're absolutely right. They don't know your mother. They don't know your brother. They don't know the person who is deceased. They don't know your husband. He probably was the best husband on the planet. They don't know your wife who's passed on. They don't know your aunt, your uncle. You know, they don't know them. They don't. Don't vilify counselors whose job is to be there to help you walk through your situation. Don't make them the bad guy. Don't, don't, don't vilify the people at the funeral home because they have to do the business of, of, of burying your loved one. Now, some of them are disreputable. I'm not here to talk about that. I understand that. I respect and I do know people who've gone through that, my own family members who've gone through that. But for the most part, most of them are, I would hope, I don't really know, so let me be careful. I would hope that most of them are reputable. It's a business. Dying is a business. Funeral homes, coffins, tombstones, uh, 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 sepulchers, or, 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 you know, they don't call them that, but that's in the Bible. Anyway, sepulchers, tombs, tombs, I guess is what we would call them now. This stuff is a business. Death certificates cost money. It's a big business. It's a billion dollar business. I know, but I'm just going to say this stuff so you can hear it come out of me. Because I, I love you. I don't have any ill will against you. 
I'm saying this so that you can start thinking so that when we all face, look, look, our, our dear sister Teresa is asking for prayers because five members have passed away in two weeks. See? So you don't need me. I mean, you know, come on, right there. Just read the comment. It's right there in front of you. I know of a situation in California, and I got to get off here, where, where five children, one vehicle accident, no, uh, one accident, a drunk driver, strikes the vehicle. Parents weren't in the vehicle. They were with somebody else, if I'm not mistaken. Parents alive, all their kids gone. Coronavirus. And I've intentionally stayed away from getting into that, but let's just be honest. Coronavirus, 250,000 people, almost 250,000 people. That's somebody's aunt, uncle, sister, brother, mother, father, grandparents. That's somebody's, that's somebody's best friend. But not just coronavirus. Let's not act like that's the only thing killing people. Cancer is still killing people. Car accidents, still killing people. Heart attacks, strokes, suicide, still, still, still. Coronavirus ain't the only thing taking people out of here. It won't be the only thing. And when they give the vaccine, probably next year, it's going to be something else that come along and it's going to take out people. And I don't say that as any disrespect. I'm 46 years old, going on 47. It's the reality of my entire life and before I was born and it'll be long after I'm gone. It's the truth. And so I've done this broadcast because I want us to really think. I want us to get back in touch and get control of our thinking. Because if we don't, when those kind of moments come, our emotions are going to whoop our butts. And if we're not careful, that, 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 that one emotion I haven't talked about of sadness, which is natural. If sadness gets out of control, it leads to depression. If sadness gets out of control, it leads to depression. Listen to me. If sadness gets out of control, it becomes depression, essentially. And one of the things that sparks sadness, probably as much, if not more than anything, is grieving. And it is definitely grieving done poorly. You have got to give yourself permission. Please, ma'am. Please, sir. Give yourself permission. Let it be okay. Now, some of you, let me say, I don't like to do this on Thursdays, but I got to do this. This subject requires it. Some of you, you've lost loved ones years ago. I mean, maybe even decades ago. And this is the first time you've heard somebody speak this way. And I want to give you permission as a pastor. I don't normally do this, but I want to give you permission as pastor. To, to grieve even that loss that was so long ago. I know. You felt like you had it conquered. You thought you were good. You don't do the grave sites anymore. You thought you were good. But as soon as you read my title, as soon as you heard me open my mouth, you heard me make a point, you heard me say mom or dad or whoever, it was all fresh. It was all fresh. And I want to encourage you finally to you specifically, those who lost loved ones years ago, Years ago, and people looking at you like, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you, why are you still sad? Baby girl, you got to, no, listen to me. What you got to do, sir, ma'am, is grieve on purpose. And you may have to set aside some time. You may be so busy with your life because you didn't want to deal with it. And what you thought you were doing to cope was really just busying yourself so you wouldn't deal with it. You were repressing and repressing and repressing. And think about this. Let me prove myself because, you know, I got to prove it. Did you start taking major medication after that person died? Did you find yourself uh, drinking, maybe taking on addictive behaviors after that person died? And you still have not shaken those addictive behaviors? Eating, drinking, whatever. Did you find yourself maybe, I mean, getting into relationships because it was a husband or a wife and, and you never thought you guys would be parted. See that, see that kind of thinking? I never thought we would be parted. Really? You, you didn't think that it's something you got married and your vow said till death. So you did think you'd be parted. You did. 
As a matter of fact, you knew that that vow meant the only way your marriage was successful is that one of you died. Now, you might not expect it to only be married for five years or 10 years. You might have thought you'd be married for 60. But there's no guarantees. There's no guarantees. I'm done. This is a tough subject. There's more I could say, but I'll leave it to those who may want to speak privately or off here. Uh, message me. Let's let's talk if you need to. The, again, there's and I just dealt with that piece. Trust me, there's other things. If you are dealing with, with, with grieving that has turned into depression, let's talk. I've given advice on this. Uh, 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 and there's some basic things that you can do to really, that's not necessarily going to a counselor, though I recommend it. Uh, 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 if you don't live near me, I don't recommend I be your counselor because we're just not, we're not close enough for me to really be able to, to, to be in front of you and help you. So I do recommend, if you can, get some services from someone close, you know, that you can sit down with uh, because you need that person-to-person -person communication. Uh, I can do my best over the phone, but that's that's not going to serve you the way you need to be served. Anyway, so 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 look, if you if you have reached that point of depression, don't beat yourself up after listening to them. Well, Gabe, now you know I really feel nah. That's just you. That's you just pushing yourself down more. Don't take my words as an excuse to beat yourself up more because I didn't do nothing to say you should beat yourself up. I had to point out the truth of the matter, but don't beat yourself up. If you are the type of person who's going to the gravesite and sitting down talking to mom and talking to dad, just deal with the truth of what I said. Are they really there? No. That's you. You could talk to them in the car on the way there. You could talk to them uh, and, and never show up to the gravesite ever again. And by the way, stop guilting people when they don't come to the gravesite. Stop. Stop. You don't have a right to tell people how to grieve. No one has a right to tell you ultimately, and I didn't do that, by the way, how to grieve. So don't tell people y'all need to go visit your mama's and your grandma's gravesite. Stop. Stop. Getting all, come, come on, get dressed up so we can go visit your brother's gravesite. Y'all ain't visited your brother. Because that's really what you're saying. And if your kids are looking at you like, okay, mom, and they grown, yeah, get the grandkids. I want them to go meet their uncle. I'm sorry. I don't mean any disrespect, but I got to be responsible here. You are broken and you need help. If you are speaking that way, please get help. Because you are not taking, your, your, taking the nieces and nephews to go visit their uncle who died before they were ever born. What are you doing? What are you doing? Don't do that. That's You're going to psychologically bruise them and you're going to do it out of selfishness. That's selfish. I'll say it. I ain't scared. Man, if you want to disconnect from me, I understand. You grown, do your thing. It don't change what I'm saying. There are people who are in my family who died long before I was born. My parents didn't take me to their grave sites to meet them because they weren't there. They weren't there. Their uncle ain't there. Their aunt isn't there. Their grandparent isn't there. Hear me. I love you. And I need you to be whole and healthy. I need you to be whole and healthy. Stop introducing people to your dead sons and daughters and moms and dads. Grieve them. Speak of them as having loved them. They are always with you in your memory, in your heart. But they're gone. Taking them to the grave sites, pulling out their favorite sweater and sitting it on the couch like they're sitting there. Nobody sitting in mom's favorite seat. Stop, 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 stop. And if you need help to stop, please get counsel. Please get counsel. If you can get Christian counsel for Christians, please do. Talk to a pastor who, who's got experience in being able to help people walk through. And he may recommend you to go to a certified counselor. Some pastors actually have uh, uh, degrees in pastoral counseling. Go to them. By all means, uh, 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 contact me. I'm not saying just because you don't live near me, you can't contact me. No, contact me. Let's talk. I can get you going. And hopefully this video will get you going in the right place. Share this out. Get this to people. Tag this. Uh, 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 tag, tag people in who you know just lost a loved one. This is perfect for them. Save them the potential years and years and years. And, and, and by all means, well, Gabe, I don't know. Maybe you kind of spoke a little tough. Look. Tag somebody who lost a child. Tag somebody who lost a, a husband or a wife. Tag somebody who this is a dear, dear, dear loved one. Tag them. Tag them. 
and encourage them to watch with you. I know this is COVID, so I'm careful. I've been be careful, but but watch it with them. Watch them. Get on Facebook. Hey, hey, hey. Log on to this uh, uh, and watch this with me. Then let's talk about it. Get on the phone, FaceTime, Zoom, whatever you got to do, and watch. You know, stop it. Listen to my points. You know, check it. Triple check it. You know, go on and on and on. If you if you don't agree with what I'm saying, go play it for your pastor. All they're going to say was, I, I may sound a little harsh to them, but I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong. We, we, we can't, we have to live our lives. We have to live. And that person who is deceased would want us to live. They would want us to live. And I want you to live. While I am alive, let me tell you, I want you to live. I want you to live a whole life. Grieve them, remember them, love them, but live. All right, dear friends, uh, have a good uh, weekend. We'll be back at our regular time. I'm better. I'm feeling better. Thank you for the prayers. So we'll be back on Thursdays at 9 Central Standard Time. Till then, have a good one. Bye-bye.